Okay. Well, welcome to our new series, our uh, 2022 series uh, on our catechetical lectures. Um, just like last year, we'll have 14 lectures in all. Uh, the lectures are going to be very similar to last year. So if you've listened to these lectures online, you're going to find that these are the same lecture topics. And some, some of these lectures are going to be very, very similar to what we did last year. Some, however, I'm kind of editing and uh, reforming a little bit and adding a lot. And so it'll change from week to week. And so even if you listen to last year's, make sure you keep coming to this year's. Um, the other thing we're doing differently is obviously we're going to be recording these, which is why we're doing them in the church. And these will be up on YouTube. So if someone's watching this and they've missed one of the other lectures, um, basically every Monday, my hope is to have this lecture up online ready to go. Um, I've had some problems with the audio system that I've been using, and so if that happens again, I don't want to do bad audio like I did for uh, the Orthodoxy and Protestantism talk, and so I'll probably have to re-record it, which means it'll go up later in the week and I'll have to do it in my office, but for right now, we're hoping that everything's working, and so we're just going to go straight into it. Um, hopefully, everyone has uh, received the Catechumen packet that has all the books uh, to read, um, and it gives all the... Uh, all the basic information about what it means to be a catechumen and how we're go going to um, approach the catechumenic period. We'll talk a little bit about that today. One note on that is that some of the books that we've had a lot of trouble getting in uh, years past because they've been out of publication are back in publication. So one of the books that we switched from the uh, catechumen book list, the, we have a separate list for the first year after you're baptized. One of those books is Elder Cleopas' uh, The Truth of Our Faith. It's been out of publication for years. It's back in. I just ordered 20 copies. They're, back, they're down in the bookstore right now. And so make sure you look through that and make sure you're keeping up with the, uh, with the book list. Um, it's always an exciting thing to begin uh, in a, uh, a new catechumen um, uh, series, uh, not just because I like teaching, but because it's a good reminder that the catechumen period is not really about the education. It's, it's really about forming souls, because when you get baptized, we have our baptismal font right here. When you get lowered in that baptismal font, the expectation or the hope is that you formed a heart that really loves Christ and that wants to simply take baptism as a continuation, as the beginning of a new life in Christ. A lot of people will, will take the catechumenate period and say, what are all the things I need to do to check off the boxes so that when I get to the baptismal font, I've done all the work and I'm ready to go and suddenly, boom, everything's done. That's, of course, the opposite of how we want to look at it. This is the training period, and it's my job to teach you the tools necessary to train yourself in the Christian life. Then, when baptism comes, you see this as the beginning of the fight by entering the arena. Not only do you enter the waters of baptism, not only do you enter the cave with Christ in which he was buried, you also enter the arena when you get baptized and my job is to give you the tools and the weapons and teach you how to use them now so that when that life begins, you're ready. Because when you're baptized, things don't get easier. They get more difficult. Why? Because the devil wants to fight you. The devil's going to fight you in every possible way he can. And so when we go through these, these 14 lectures, and I want to go through what these lectures will look like, you're going to see that there's a common theme. And the theme that we're going to hit again and again and again with every lecture is your relationship with Christ. Why is that so important? Because just like any other relationship in your life, it takes work. It takes work. And as with some relationships in your wives, some in your in your lives, sometimes there are those who are kind of fighting against you in this. Okay? You can think about this in in terms of marriage. Sometimes we have in-laws who just don't really like you very much and so they make your life difficult or even work. I have plenty of people who come and they tell me about work situations where they're kind of rising up in the company and there are those around them who are getting jealous. And when they get jealous, they make their life harder. In this case, it's much, much more difficult because the demons are fighting against you. And so I'm here to give you the tools and the weapons necessary to fight so that your relationship with Christ can continue to grow and be refined. And in the process, your soul and really your heart becomes refined and it becomes a new throne for Christ. This is really the, the entire goal. If I had to wrap up the entire goal of the Christian life, it's to make your heart a new throne for Christ. That's what everything's about. So that idea of relationship is going to come up again and again and again. So what are the 14 lectures we'll talk about? Today, 
Today, there's a little bit less meat because I'm just really setting the stage for everything. And so if you, if you leave today and say, well, I didn't learn a lot of facts, you're going to learn some facts, but really those are going to come later because right now I need to set the stage for you. So today we'll talk about the illness and the yearning of man. Basically, why is man the way he is? And what is it that our hearts are yearning for and striving for? Lecture two will be theology and the nature of God. Who is God, essentially, and how do we talk about God? Lecture three will be the fall and the nature of man. So once we understand a bit about the nature of God, if we're made in the image and according to the likeness of God, what does that mean for man? And in this lecture, we'll talk about sin and temptation, the passions and the soul. And we'll talk about the idea of uh, what it means to have a, a, an Orthodox worldview, a Christian worldview. Four, we'll talk about the Trinity and the person and work of Jesus Christ. In lecture five, we'll talk about the cure of man, part one. So how is man cured of this illness we've already talked about? We talked about who God is. We need to talk about how to reunite the two so that God reveals himself to man and man lives in communion with God. So in part one of the cure of man, we'll talk about asceticism, the commandments, and worship. Essentially, what we'll really talk about is the topic of repentance. What does repentance look like from an orthodox standpoint? In lecture six, which is the cure of man part two, we'll talk about the efforts of God in this. So the efforts of man are the ones from the previous lecture, asceticism, following the commandments and worship. The efforts of God, we'll talk about grace, spirituality, and the holy mysteries. In lecture seven, we'll talk about what the church is, what the scriptures are, and what their place is within the church, and what holy tradition is. This is a topic that comes up a lot when we talk, especially to Protestants. They want to know what tradition is, what is holy tradition, how is that different from what the scriptures condemn as the traditions of men, which is what Christ talks about. In lecture eight, we'll talk more specifically about the holy mysteries, or what are known as the sacraments, and the structure of the church. In lecture number nine, we'll talk about prayer, the saints and their veneration, and the Panagia, or the Virgin Mary. And we'll also talk a little bit about icons and the place of icons within the worship of the church. In lecture 10, we'll talk about fasting, a big part of the Christian life and why it's necessary, what it's about. We'll talk about what it means to be an ecclesial being. Ecclesial, meaning of the church. What does it mean to be shaped by the church? And how do we act in the church in humility? And we'll talk about the church of the home then as well. How do we take what we live here and apply it to home life? In lecture number 11, we'll talk about the services of the church, and then we'll also talk a bit about the end times, what the Orthodox Church teaches about the end times, and about the topic of life after death. In lecture 12, we'll look at some notes on church history and the ecumenical councils, and we'll go through those rather quickly. I'm trying to keep these, these to shorter lectures, and so we'll go through the ecumenical councils quickly. And then for the rest of 12, and then for 13 and 14, we're going to do the same thing. Where, where what we'll do is we'll take the major saints of the church and talk about everything that we discussed in those first 11 and a half lectures and how that actually is applied in the heart of actual people. What does it actually look like when we form it? In other words, we're going to talk about all these figures who surround us and how they utilized everything that I'm going to give you and, and lived it and became sanctified in it. So in that uh, lecture 12, we'll talk about the great theologians of the church. Lecture 13, We'll talk a lot about the great spiritual guides of the church that we still read today. And then in 14, one of my favorites, we'll talk about uh, quite a few of the modern saints and elders, people who lived within our own lifetimes or within the last generation. There are people alive who actually knew these people can tell you about them. So that'll be a good one. Okay, um, a little housekeeping before we get going. Uh, Leo and Banu, uh, neither of them is here right now, but Leo and, and uh, Banu are the two who are in charge of uh, catechumen... Uh, um, uh, the catechumen uh, uh, church ministry that we have. So any paperwork that you have, if you don't give it to me, you, you can give it to them. Hopefully everyone's filled out the, uh, the, the one piece of paperwork you need to fill out, um, the catechumen information sheet. Um, when it comes time for baptism, they'll assign you a room to get changed in. They'll give you all the instructions on that. Uh, in addition to these lectures, the ideal is that you're, you're meeting with me once a month as a catechumen. If you're a catechumen in the church, I want you meeting with me once a month just to simply update me on how you're doing. And that's where I want to know, I'm not going to give you a test. I'm going to ask you how your prayer life is going. And I'm going to ask you how you're integrating in, into the life of the, of the church. 
And that's where you'll bring your, your uh, questions. And so one of the things that I really highly recommend you doing is having a notebook on which you write questions as they come along. A lot of those questions you're going to find will be answered as you live the life of the faith. And you can cross those out. But the ones that aren't answered, when you meet with me once a month, you can bring them in. And one of the things you can do is if you're looking for a time to meet with me, you can actually just sign up for one of the confession spots. So every Saturday, uh, I do confessions. They're just 15-minute slots. And so you can sign up your name for one of those right on my door and just meet me during that time. If 15 minutes isn't enough, talk to me. Maybe you can sign up for half an hour. If you need something more than that, it'd be better to do it during the week or outside of those confession time slots so we don't take up a lot of those. Um, make sure you're keeping up with the book list. There aren't that many books to, to read, but I want to make sure everyone's actually keeping up with that. And then it's important that that book list does have a number of books for the first year after baptism. I know a lot of people don't actually read those. Those are there, not because I'm going to test you, not because I want to make your life miserable, but because they're helpful. They're extremely helpful, and you're going to be inspired by them. They're going to help you get through that first year after baptism. I don't want to say get through as if it's just all horrible. It's a great blessing, and there's a lot of joy, but there are temptations that come along with it. And to keep that zeal up, to keep that fire in you lit, there are some really good books suggested. And so make sure you keep that book list and continue reading those books. Uh, for those who are preparing for baptism, if your baptism is coming close, uh, there are five things you want to make sure you do just practically. Number one, you want to look for a godparent. Uh, do not ask someone to be your sponsor or your godparent for baptism without talking to me first. Come talk to me, say I'm thinking about this person, or if you can't think of someone, come talk to me and I'll make some suggestions. Second, uh, be thinking about a patron saint. So find a saint. Most people will choose a saint who is close to whatever name they already have. If your name is John, we have plenty of St. John's. But you may find a saint, or you may not have a name that, that uh, is already a saint's name, but you may find a saint that you just feel especially close to, and you, you really uh, uh, enjoy seeking this person's intercessions. You find their life really inspiring. You want them as a patron. Just come talk to me about it. In, in most cases, that's fine. Okay. Uh, you'll also want to make sure you get measured for a robe. Uh, so we have uh, Connie who does that. She'll measure you for your robe. There's a small payment to go along just to pay for the materials and the work for the robe. And then uh, for the uh, uh, baptismal certificate from the archdiocese, I think it's only a $10 fee for that one. And then you'll also want to set up a time for a life confession. And we'll talk about that when we get to uh, the talk on the Holy Mysteries and, and the sacraments. But those, those are the five things as you get close. So about a month, month and a half before baptism, you'll want to sit down and, and we want to go through all those and make sure that you have all those set, okay? All right, so what is catechism? Catechism simply is instruction in the faith. And so if you're a catechumen, you are one who is being instructed in the faith. And again, this, this is not primarily an intellectual instruction. Intellectual instruction is a big part of it, but it's really meant as a tool. It's a good and necessary tool, but it's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to begin integrating your life into a life of faith. It's really to take everything about who you are and how you function in the world and literally change your citizenship. Change your citizenship. I was uh, watching a, uh, an old episode. I guess they're all old episodes now because they're, they're, at least one of them isn't alive. I think they're both not alive anymore. But if you know who Siskel and Ebert are, Siskel and Ebert used to be, uh, every Sunday they would have a movie, movie review show and uh, they would argue with each other all the time. And um, I was watching an old episode of this. It's interesting to see what, what the movies that used to come out uh, actually looked like compared to today when it's just all superheroes and junk. Uh, but there was one called, um, something like Chan is Missing or so, something, along, something along these lines. I forget the exact name of the movie. But essentially it was a, it was a movie, um, kind of a, a mystery as a Chinese American in Chinatown in San Francisco goes missing. And a couple of his friends begin kind of searching for him and asking around. And they talked about how the movie really isn't about the, this mystery. It's really about what it means to be a Chinese American and how so many had a, had a tough time uh, deciding whether they were a Chinese person living in America or whether they were a Chinese person who had immigrated to America and now was primarily American or whether there was some mix of that. And it was really a movie about identity. And this is what the catechumen it is. It's about identity. It's about saying, okay, I may live in the world, but I'm not of the world. My citizenship is in heaven. This is directly from the New Testament. St. Peter talks a lot about this. St. Paul talks about this. 
my citizenship is primarily in heaven, which means I need to live as a citizen of heaven, which means I need to learn what that means. And I need to, be, need to begin integrating that. And this is, this is really how the saints lived. I tell people all the time they lived as if with one foot on earth and one foot in heaven. They, they may be physically on this earth, but spiritually, they're really not of this earth at all. They're already in heaven, which is why you can see them do on a really practical plane. You see them do miraculous things. The, the, the boundaries of space and time that we have on this earth no longer bind them because spiritually they're already living in heaven. Or another way to say that is they've taken heaven and they've implanted heaven directly in their hearts. By the way, this is why Orthodox churches are shaped the way they are. Instead of having steeples, which is this image of man reaching up to God, we have these domed ceilings and right above us we have this large icon of Christ. And it's the image of Christ bending the heavens with this domed ceiling and coming down to man. This is what we want. We want paradise to be yanked from heaven and brought down directly to man for Christ to bring it to us. But in order to do that, we need a place suitable for paradise, which is why we seek to purify the heart. That's what the catechumenate period is about. Learning all of those tools so that we can properly purify our heart after baptism and make it a suitable place for paradise and for the throne of Christ. In the early church, this was a three-year process. In the very, very beginning, you see people baptized right away, but they're mainly baptized because they're Jews who are expecting and awaiting for the Savior. So when the Messiah comes, they're ready because they, this is what their whole life was aimed at. For the large number of pagans and Gentiles brought in, though, it became apparent that being brought into the church quickly wasn't necessarily a good thing. A lot of people would apostatize and leave, which was a danger for them. But also, with the pagan understanding, they didn't understand what it meant to be a Christian. They didn't understand what this meant for their lives. So rather than have somebody join the church and then tell them, oh, by the way, you can't be sleeping around the way you've been doing that, the church wanted to make sure that people had this instruction beforehand and that people could integrate this into their lives in a reasonable way. And then and only then were they brought into the church. So it was usually a three-year period. We take six months to a year for most catechumens, but this is how, how it was done in the early church. But this is also why the catechumenate is a process. This period is a process because obviously changing one aspect of your life is a tough thing to do. Changing your entire life and your citizenship, that is a really tough thing to do. St. Justin Popovich has, this, it's a little bit of a lengthy quote, but it's so beautiful about what it means to really be Orthodox and what Orthodoxy is really about. He says this, he reposed by the way in 1979, so he's one of these relatively recent saints. He says, quote, all the truths of orthodoxy emerge from one truth and converge on one truth, infinite and eternal. That truth is the God-man Christ. If you experience any truth of orthodoxy to its limit, you will inevitably, inevitably discover that its kernel is the God-man Christ. In fact, all the truths of orthodoxy are nothing other than different aspects of the one truth, the God-man Christ. Orthodoxy is orthodoxy by reason of the God-man, and not by reason of anything else or anyone else. Hence, another name for orthodoxy is God-manhood. It is nothing, in, in it, nothing exists through man or by man, but everything comes from the God-man and exists through the God-man. This means that man experiences and finds out about the fundamental eternal truth of life and the world only with the help of the God-man in the God-man. And it means it's something else. Man learns the complete truth about man, about the purpose and meaning of his existence only through the God-man. Outside of him, a man turns into an apparition, into a scarecrow, into nonsense. Instead of a man, you find the dregs of a man, the fragments of a man, the scraps of a man. Therefore, true manhood lies only in God-manhood, and no other manhood exists under heaven. Why is the God-man the fundamental truth of orthodoxy? Because he answered all the questions that torture and torment the human spirit. The question of life and death. The question of good and evil. The question of heaven and earth. The question of truth and falsehood. The question of love and hate. The question of justice and injustice. In brief, the question of man and God. Why is the God-man the fundamental truth of orthodoxy? Because he proved in the most obvious way by his own earthly life that he is the incarnate 
humanized and personified eternal truth, eternal justice, eternal love, eternal joy, eternal power. Total truth, total justice, total love, total joy, total power. This, this is the heart of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy, the first thing you need to know is that everything in the church is centered upon the person of Jesus Christ. Everything. Orthodoxy is really beautiful, and it's very ornate, as you've noticed. But that ornateness can be a temptation in itself. You can become overly focused on the beauty of the iconography, or overly focused on the beauty of the chanting, or overly focused on all the spiritual reading. You can become overly focused on a lot of these things and miss out that everything points its way back to Jesus Christ. This is the most Christ-centric faith on the face of this earth. Orthodoxy is it. We make the mistake of missing out on that point. And so if nothing else, remind yourself that everything the church is, everything the church does, everything the church has, everything the church hopes for, for you leads you back to Christ, the God-man Jesus Christ. This is everything. So this means that in the catechism and in everything we do, Although there are things that I want you to do, I want you to read the books, I want you to meet with me, I want you to prepare in all these different ways, I want you to pray at home, I want you to begin, begin fasting, it's not about checking off the boxes. You could do everything, absolutely everything, to the T on the list of things that are required for catechumens and still not be a catechumen who's living the faith in his heart. You could miss out on the purpose if you're not focused on Christ and your relationship with him. You need to be transformed by Christ and be strengthened by Christ. And you'll miss out on that if you see this as a relationship about checking off the boxes. That'll increase a lot of anxiety in you, and it'll also increase pride in you as you do check off the boxes. And that's not what we want. What we want is to see that these boxes are really about making sure you're living out the tools so that you can form and reform your relationship with Christ and thus reform who you are in the depths of your soul. The main attack of the devil during this period and right after baptism is not going to be a full frontal attack. We expect this from the devil. We expect him to, for him to come at us in a way that's so obvious that we can see the attack and say, ha, what's, what's the saying today? Not today, Satan, not today. No, that's not the way the devil's going to attack you mainly. The, de the devil will mainly attack you through what? Ambivalence. Ambivalence and a slow falling away. This happens all the time, by the way. All the time. People don't realize it, but they start to say this most dangerous word. The most dangerous word in the spiritual life is what word? Tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll fast. Tomorrow I'll pray. Tomorrow I'll go to church. Today I'm tired. Today I'm distracted. Today I'm busy. Today I'm just too frustrated. I'm too this, I'm too that. Tomorrow I can do. Well, what happens when tomorrow comes? There's a new tomorrow, and a new tomorrow, and a new tomorrow, until life without Christ becomes normalized again, and suddenly you forget everything. This happens all the time. Every single year I warn catechumens about this, and every single year we baptize people, and they get real excited after the baptism. They feel this great flood of grace. They come as much as they can. They're praying, they're fasting, they're reading. And then about a month, two months, three months in, we don't see them for a Sunday, and then two Sundays, and three Sundays, and they start to fall away. And when I contact them, I say, hey, how you doing? They say, oh, don't worry, sorry, Father, I know I haven't been there, but, you know, life has just gotten really busy. But I, I swear, I'm going to come this Sunday. And sometimes I see them, and sometimes I don't. And often I see them for that one Sunday, and then I don't see them again. Beware, beware. The devil wants to make you ambivalent, and to make you forget the great grace of Christ. This is a lifelong commitment, not because it's a lifelong burden, but because it's a lifelong process of freeing you from the chains of sin. It takes a long time. We've been living apart from Christ for so long. If you've been living apart from Christ for 30 years, don't expect that that's going to be undone permanently in the course of six months or a year. It takes a process. And like I said, this is a relationship. Relationships need work. I've been married for... 14 years. I had to think for a second. 14 years. We just had our anniversary a few weeks ago. We still have to work on our relationship. That's a necessary thing. We work in it. It continues to grow and strengthen. And when we don't do that, it begins to become fractured. Very, very easy. I've seen people married for 20, 30 years, and they decide to call it quits. How is that possible? You have to work on it.
So what's most important in the catechetical period? Four things. What I'm looking for in you are these four things. Do you yearn for Christ and his church? Are these things that you really yearn for and want more of? Two, do you desire the services? Are the services more boxes to be checked off? Are they burdens and obligations for you? Or are they things that you're learning to fall in love with? It takes time. It takes work. It takes going through many services that feel boring at first. They do feel like work for a time, but eventually you fall in love with them and you want them. I've had people, they started to come uh, to morning liturgies and after about a month, they said they couldn't do without him anymore. We just had in the first two weeks of August, we were doing the Paraclesi service to the Theotokos every evening. And when those two weeks were done, somebody wrote me a text and said, Father, what am I supposed to do now? He goes, I went to every single one of those. What am I supposed to do now? And I said, yeah, you could pray that service at home. He said, I can? I said, yes. He says, good, because I, I don't think I can live without this anymore. I got you In two weeks, I got so used to it. It's now just part of my evening routine. And when I don't have it, I feel like something's missing. And I notice that my thoughts start going wild and my life starts going right back into its old ways again. I need that service. I said, by all means, I'll text it to you. So are you learning to desire the services? Three, are you learning to love prayer and fasting? I don't want you just to pray and fast. I want you to love to pray and to love to fast. That's really the goal. And four, it means becoming an active member of the community. It means getting to know people, being involved in the community, whether that's in the choir or cleaning or bringing food, uh, being part of the reading group, whatever it is, being part of the young adult group, be part of the community, get to know people, form those connections. Form those connections. Don't just come, receive some, some information, some grace, and then leave. Become part of the community. Not only is that good for you and it, it keeps you grounded in the community, but also you may have something that someone else needs. Don't forget that you're here not just to get, but to give. You're here to serve. And you may see opportunities with others who are struggling to serve them. And you may say, well, how could, I don't have anything to give right now. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But in six months, maybe you'll have more. And a year from now, maybe you'll have even more. You'll have more to give the more time you're here. Okay, two preliminary points before we get into some of the theology of the church. Number one, you need to know theology is a circle. And what we mean by that is, if you touch any point on a circle, you're already connected to all the other points. And this is why doing these catechumen lectures can be difficult, because we can't fragment and compartmentalize the theology of the church. I can't say, today I'm going to give you all about Mariology, theology about Mary. Well, because if I talk about Mary, I have to talk about the Incarnation, which means I have to talk about Christ which means I have to talk about what he was a savior of, which means I have to talk about the fall of man, which means I have to talk about sin, which means I have to talk about creation, which we see. So there's nothing we can talk about where we don't touch on a lot of all the other points, which is what, one of the reasons I say this is there are going to, going to be some things that I may say to you that you find a little confusing, and we may just touch on those aspects in future lectures. And so this is one of the reasons that I really encourage people, once we're done with the entire series, go back and start it all over again. Because now that you have a bigger view, you can go back and now things fit better. It's like if I give you a puzzle piece and one puzzle piece alone and none of the puzzles put together and I say, well, place this in the right spot on the board. I don't even know where this goes. But if you have like 60% of the puzzle done, there's a much better chance you can say, oh, I know where this fits now. If you have 90% of the puzzle done, there's a really good chance you'll know where that piece is supposed to go. And so after, you, after we've gone through all the lectures, go back and listen to them again within the first year. It's a good idea. And number two... Never forget that our focus is always on relationship, and relationship in Christ is focused on one thing, mainly above all else, repentance. I tried for a long time to figure out what it is that separates orthodoxy from Western Christianity, or what we call heterodoxy. And this would include Protestants and Catholics. So I grew up Protestant before my family became Orthodox. I was, I think, 12. I went to a couple Catholic universities, and there was always this sense of a different feeling. There was something deep that I just, I couldn't put my finger on. I could tell you about the compare and contrast charts and where we differ on theology and doctrines and everything and history, but there was something deeper that I couldn't put my finger on. And then one day it hit me. Only in orthodoxy, only in orthodoxy is there a great emphasis on daily deepening 
living repentance. This is what really sets orthodoxy apart. Daily, deepening, living repentance. We'll talk in future lectures about what repentance actually is. It's actually a very positive thing. It's not a negative thing for us at all. It's not about beating yourself up. But only in orthodoxy is there this sense of constantly deepening repentance up until our very final breath. We never end in our repentance. It doesn't matter how holy a person is, that repentance continues on and on and on. Only in orthodoxy do we find that. And that's central to everything we talk about. We can talk about all the academic theology in the world. If it doesn't lead back to repentance, it's not worthwhile. And if we're not living out our repentance, I don't care how many theology books you read. You can read 50 theology books and come and tell me. I had somebody come to me once. They said, Father, I want, and this wasn't in this parish, by the way, but they said, I want to become a catechumen. I said, great. I said, well, what, what, led, what led you here? I mean, you know, you, you, you must know something about orthodoxy if you show up on an orthodox church's front steps. And the person said, oh, I know all about orthodoxy. I've already read the entire Philokalia. If you don't know what the Philokalia is, it's a five-volume collection of uh, ascetical writings, mainly having to do with prayer and the deep aspects of prayer of the heart. And they were very excited. They, they read the entire Philokalia. And I, went, I looked at them and I said, I haven't even read the entire Philokalia. <laughs> it's not because I haven't had time or the will to do it, but because I'm not there yet. None of that would be understandable to me unless I'd lived the faith for a while first. And even the Philokalia is not read in its entirety by monastics. They read it in a certain order, and it's not chronological like it's written. They, they, they read the simpler things first about basic repentance and basically living the faith, and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And there are some, some uh, uh, writings in that that monks and nuns won't read until they've been a monk or a nun for 30, 40 years. Because they're just not ready for it yet. So repentance is a process, and we need to make sure that we're not going about this in a purely academic way, but we're living the faith and living our repentance. Okay. That means that... Uh, we may go about this in what looks at times like an unsystematic way, because again, theology is a circle and we can't go about it perfectly systematically. But again, this is not a bad thing. That, that idea of theology as a circle is actually a good thing because it, what it means is that theology is a living reality. Theology is something to be experienced, not just learned. And we want our knowledge about God to be based in some sort of mystery. Can you imagine having a God that we could fully understand? That we could fully comprehend? Our mind would seem greater than God himself, and suddenly we would start worshiping ourselves, which is essentially what's happened to our society. We want God to remain in mystery a little bit. So if you're struggling with, with understanding something, don't worry about it. Come talk to me. And there are some things I may tell you. I've done this with many people where I say, that's okay. Just continue to struggle with that one. Well, isn't there an answer to this? Yeah, there's an answer, but that's not where you are yet. You're in the living reality of, of theology. You need that to be understandable to you, which means you need to get to a certain point. So keep praying, keep fasting, keep reading the scriptures, and eventually this will become understandable to you. There was um, a priest I know in uh, Tennessee who had a man come to him. This was like a multi-PhD genius type guy. And he became a catechumen, but he had these questions, and he kept, he kept hammering the priest with these questions. I don't understand this, I don't understand this, I don't understand this. And the priest, just after like months of working with him and trying to explain these things, he finally said, you know what, let's stop for a second. For the next 40 days, no questions. Hey, but Father, these are so... No, just trust me on this. For the next 40 days, no questions. I want you to come to every single service. And when there isn't a service, I want you to pray for an extra half hour at home. I want you to fast. I want you to do prostrations and read the scriptures. And he gave him a prayer rule. He gave him all these things to do at home. He told him to come to every service he could. And after 40 days, this guy came to the priest and said, Father, I get it. I get it. Thank you. Just by humbling himself down, by quieting that, that constant voice in him, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? He just decided to stand in the presence of the grace and mystery of God. And in doing so, his heart calmed a little bit and suddenly it became more receptive to that mystery. Because it wasn't so much about how I can intellectually agree with everything I see, but rather taking the wisdom of this 2,000 years of grace being poured out upon these saints and just standing in the midst of it and being transformed by it. Okay, what makes for a healthy Orthodox Christian? Repentance is what we already talked about. Repentance makes for a healthy Orthodox Christian. 
There's an article by Father Sarah from Rose. I don't think this was in the Catechumen packet. It really should be. Um, I'll make sure it goes. We're revamping the whole website. So probably in a month or two, the whole website will be revamped, have a lot of new information on it. And one of the things that will be in the Catechumen, there will be a Catechumen um, uh, like resource center. And one of the articles will be this, this um, article about uh, convert pitfalls from Father Sarah from Rose. And he talks about all the typical things that happens with converts. A lot of converts will go through what I call the crazy convert syndrome. I did this, by the way, when I was in college, where I became super, Mr. Super Orthodox, and I knew all the right answers to everything. And uh, I could tell every, every priest in every monastery what they were doing wrong and everybody else why they weren't serious enough about the faith. And, of course, the one thing I wasn't doing was living out my repentance. I wasn't praying and fasting. But I was reading stuff, and I knew better than everybody else. That's why I warn people against this all the time. You want to watch out, so keep repentance as the central aspect of what you're doing. And so how do we mix in these two things, this idea of theology as a, as a mysterious circle and this idea of living out our repentance? And what does that ultimately mean for how orthodoxy approaches God? There's an image I like to give. Is it an oversimplification? Yes, those are necessary, though, because these things just get too deep. But I like to tell people to imagine... Imagine God as this amalgamous, floating, pulsating ball of light in, in the air. And we're sitting staring at it, and we're trying to figure out who God is. What happened in the West is the Pope, or really what happened with when, when they went through a period of scholastic theology in Thomas Aquinas, they looked at this, this mystery and said, I want to write down every detail I can about what I see. Every detail about this, this floating mystery. I want to write down and say what's true and what's not true about this. So they wrote down in detailed form everything they could. If you've ever read Thomas Aquinas, this is essentially what the Summa is. The problem is, is that after writing a whole bunch, someone else came along. That someone else was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther said, you got a big problem. You're standing in the wrong spot. Don't stand here. The proper perspective on God is found right over here. And when I look at it from this angle, this is what I see. And started writing down every little thing. And then Calvin came along. And Calvin said, no, no, no. you got to stand here. And started writing down everything he's. And then Zwingli came along. And then one after another after another. Until all these people were supposedly looking at the same God of Scripture and finding very different things. The orthodox approach to this is to look in all humility and just say, there's no way I can understand what I see in front of me. I, I can't understand this. What I need to do is get out of my own head. Basically get rid of all that egoism in me that says that I could understand this when I know I can't. Humble myself down in repentance and then step right into the middle of it. And in stepping in the middle of the mystery, I'm not going to try to describe every detail I see. I'm just going to experience God firsthand. And when I'm in the midst of it, then, then I notice that being in the middle of it, my vision of everything else changes. And rather than seeing God as I want to see him, God enlightens me to see the world as it really is and as he sees it. I want the mind of Christ. And then, then, if I'm forced to, when someone asks me what this experience is like, I'll tell them. But when I tell them, I fully admit that my words will never suffice because the experience is always greater than human language. This is what a life of repentance does. A life of repentance is meant to help purify us so that we can step into the mystery of God and God can dwell inside of us. Repentance is our focus. I know when somebody is doing well in the church, when they come to me, and they have deep questions about prayer and repentance. I know someone's not doing well when all their questions are about outward things. And this happens. People will come and they'll ask a hundred different questions. Why do we do it this way, not this way? Why is this bishop doing this and not this? Why do we believe this and not this? Those aren't bad things in and of themselves. But what they never seem to ask about is, how can I deepen my prayer? How can I repent more fully before Christ? How can I achieve humility? When people aren't asking those questions, it worries me that repentance is not the center of their faith. I know a lot of people who can quote multiple saints, but what they can't seem to do is realize that all those saints could answer those questions because they started off with repentance. 
So, the idea that we focus on repentance, which I said before, it's important that I note this. We'll talk about this more in the future, but again, repentance is a positive thing. It's a joy for us. We love to live our, out our repentance. And we'll talk more about that, but for now, you need to know this. The fact that we talk so much about repentance means that we're, repentance is for us a living reality, which means it's a movement. You can't stand still and not change and repent at the same time. Repentance means we're changing. Or better yet, it means we're being transfigured. And if we're being transfigured, it means hopefully we're moving towards something greater. And if we're moving towards something greater, then it means that we are not where we're meant to be right now. Or a better way of saying that, we aren't who we're meant to be right now. So that brings us to today's topic of the illness and yearning of man. We live, we live in abnormal times with abnormal lives. And we're so used to them, we don't even realize how abnormal they are anymore. This is the nature of life. When you live in abnormality for a long time, that abnormality becomes your normal. We're not seeking our normal. Otherwise, it's every man for himself. We're seeking God's normal. I was listening to this um, really interesting uh, uh, little thing on the news once, radio news. And they were talking about this. Ideas about things that have become so normal for you that you didn't realize until you met other people that it wasn't actually normal. And this, uh, this woman called in and she talked about how every single night that she grew up, every single night, they'd have dinner around 6, 6, 37, but about 9, 9, 30 at night, her mom would make some fried chicken every single night. And so she grew up with this every single night, having fried chicken 9, 9, 30 at night. And she goes off to college and she's got roommates. And so she looks at her roommate the first night and she goes, who's making the chicken tonight? And her roommate looks at her and goes, what are you talking about? She goes, you know, fried chicken. Oh, are we having fried chicken? She goes, yeah, don't, don't you have fried chicken every night before you go to sleep? She had no idea that this was not a normal thing that everybody did. This was just her family. So this is how we are. But we live in times that are so abnormal with everything abnormal around us. We don't even realize just how far from godly ways of life we actually are. And what's really strange is the more advanced we become, the greater our normalcy, really abnormality is, the worse off we seem to get and no one seems to question it. Have you ever thought about this? We know more about the human brain than at any time in history. And yet we have more people seeking psychologists and therapists than any time in history. We know more about international cultures, multiculturalism, and, and, and international relations than ever before, and yet we seem to have more wars and more tension than ever before. We know more about medical science than ever before, and yet we seem to have more illnesses and cancers than ever before, and more fear about health than ever before. We have more access to constant entertainment and comfort and yet we have more depression and anxiety than ever before. The more advanced we seem to become, the more miserable and worse off we seem to get. And yet we rarely question that. What's happening? What's happening is simple, is we're finding sec supposed security in all of those advancements. And so we're no longer seeking God. We think we need God less because we have all the answers already. Why do we need to go to an invisible God when visible man has all the answers? In other words, even in the most advanced and normal times, man is still unfulfilled. Man is unfulfilled. There's a sense within us that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. And by the way, I've heard even atheists say this. They see death and they see suffering all around them and they recognize that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. And I've seen plenty of atheists use this language. Things aren't supposed to be this way. But whenever you use the word supposed, what are you implying? You're implying that there should be an intent and a per, and a, or a purpose in creation and there's a strong sense that we aren't achieving the true potential of our humanity. Even within atheism, 
there seems to be this recognition that we aren't living the way that man is supposed to be living. That there's some sort of intent in our creation that we're not living out. One of the responses we get to this idea is that what we need to do is rediscover God, and so therefore we're going to go about this by giving a bunch of proofs for God. We were not going to talk about proofs of God in this, in this catechism lecture. But in the West, this is a, a lot of times what happens. You notice what happens when we seek proofs for God? What are we doing with that mysterious ball? We're still standing outside of it. We're saying, I want to describe this in a way to prove to you that this is actually God right here. Because your, your face is turned away from it. And I want to get you to, to look at it. But those proofs for God don't seem to convince very many people. I don't know if you've ever looked into these, by the way. You can look at these on, on, online. Look on YouTube, proofs for God, and you'll find the four or five basic proofs for God. But there is one proof for God that I think is actually really quite convincing and helpful, and it's, it's this one. It's, it's the idea that if we live in a purely material world, just based in materialistic evolution, man wouldn't have a yearning in himself for something that he can't seem to find. Any yearning that would be baked into us by materialistic evolution should be found right in front of us because we've been evolving for millions of years, and so man should be hardwired to be satisfied and fulfilled with whatever's right in front of him. But man isn't. Man isn't fulfilled with whatever's right in front of him. He's seeking something deeper, something transcendent, something grander. That in itself shows us internally that we recognize that there must be something greater and transcendent beyond just the material world that is there to fill us, to fulfill us, to give us purpose. We know instinctively that within us, there's a part of us that yearns. And we know what it's yearning for. It yearns for God. Unfortunately, this yearning has been doled over and covered. And what we really spend a lot of time doing is trying to be distracted from that yearning. We're afraid of that yearning. And so we go to more entertainment. We go to more comforts. And a lot of times we go to addictions. We go to alcohol. We go to drugs. We go to sex. We go to whatever it is we can think of that will help us be so comforted that we no longer have to think about these deeper questions of, of, of life. But ultimately, we wake up the next morning unfulfilled yet again, feeling empty. This is, it's, it's funny because we even see this on TV, right? Even television shows. It's funny to me that, that the, the idea today is like, we need our television shows to properly represent the populace around us. And so like every TV show needs a trans character today. It needs a trans character. But I'm like, but the majority of, of Americans for the past 40, 50 years have been Christian. And how many times have you seen a positive portrayal of a Christian on a, on a sitcom? never happens. Never happens. But even with the ones who are atheistic, what's, what's a common sitcom trope that we see all the time? The sex-crazed character, right? Back in Friends, it was Joey. Um, there's one show that I never watched. Uh, How I Met Your Mother. I don't know the guy's name, but like the skinny blonde guy. He was like the sex-crazed guy on that, from what I understand. I could be wrong about this. I've never seen it. But like this is a common sitcom trope. You have the sex-crazed maniac. And he's, he's, the, he's there for comic relief, right? And he's just going to sleep around and have fun doing that. But like four or five seasons in, eventually he has this realization where he goes, I'm tired of living this empty existence. And I need something deeper. I need real human connect. Like even Hollywood knows that man is yearning for something greater and deeper. Even Hollywood knows this. They, of course, they want to find it in just a simple human relation. And what will happen is, is if those sitcoms were based in reality, they'd get together and they'd get married for a year or two and then say, well, you no longer make me happy. And they'd leave and they'd be miserable again. I mean, if we're going to be totally honest about it. Because we have something deeper within us. We know, in other words, that we're missing something. I think it was, was it, uh, I think it was St. Augustine, who, or maybe it was C.S. Lewis. I can't remember. Those are pretty far apart in history. But either way, who said that we have a, a God-shaped hole in our heart. Only God can fill it. So we know that as much as we try to fill that sense of purpose with things around us, earthly things, with success, with money, with fame, again, with material things, with alcohol, with drugs, we know that none of these things will actually fulfill them in the end. 
None of these things actually fills up that sense of purpose and yearning that we have with, deep within us. So, as I said, these classes, when we examine the nature of God and man, our golden thread throughout all these classes is going to be examining the relationship between the two, between God and man. Because it's only in this that we really discover the fulfillment of that deep yearning within us. Ultimately, the problem for man always narrows down to one thing and one thing only. It's the problem of death. Death, ultimately, is the final problem for mankind. But the problem of death cannot be conquered by itself with the expectation that if this alone is corrected and cured, all of man's others, other ills will go away. In other words, if I could give you a pill that gives you eternal life, you will never get sick and you'll never die. Unless you're hit by a bus, you're never going to die. Even if you knew you were going to live the next thousand years, if we live without purpose, we're going to live for misery for a thousand years. Man doesn't want to just live and not experience death. He wants to live with purpose. Unfortunately, ultimately, the world suggests that the solution to this is that we create our own purpose. But that doesn't work too well. Why doesn't that work too well? Well, number one, purpose can change from person to person. And that means that if purpose isn't consistent among people, it means that that purpose doesn't really have e eternal existence. What, so what, something that can give me purpose today won't give me purpose tomorrow. Number two, if we're just creating our own purpose, well, one per person's purpose can injure another per person's purpose. We saw this in the 20th century quite a bit. Obviously, as Orthodox, the first thing we think of is communism. Plenty of people thought their, their purpose was to bring communism to the world. And that meant that you had to imprison and kill those who disagreed with you. Doesn't help. Three, if purpose is changing from purpose, person to person, as I said, it can change within a single person, which means what gives me purpose today may not give me purpose tomorrow. Well, that means that whatever I have purpose with today, I'm not really satisfied with because I know that it may change tomorrow. So why am I so focused on it in the first place? And number four, we already talked about that main problem of mankind. There is no magic pill. So if we create our own purpose, we still have to deal with that issue, little tiny issue of death. Created our own purpose can't conquer death. So there's a text that I wrote, a little like spiritual introduction to orthodoxy. I haven't, I haven't published it yet. I don't know if it'll ever be published. I don't know if it's good enough to be published, but... Um, in, in, I talk about this, this yearning for man and, and, and seeking true purpose. And in this text, I talk about how true purpose must have four characteristics. And I want to read from you uh, part of what I wrote in this text. The first three of these characteristics are these. Number one, purpose and meaning must be based in truth. Number two, purpose and meaning must be unchanging. Then number three, purpose and meaning must extend beyond death. So before getting to the fourth characteristic, let's first offer a short explanation of these first three. First, purpose and meaning must be based in truth. If our meaning is based in falsehood, then we have built our purpose on a foundation that is already broken and thus without stability. It is like building a tall building on unstable ground that we have decided falsely is sol solid. The ground will eventually give way and the building will crumble. We must therefore base our meaning and purpose in life on what is true. Second, true meaning and purpose must be unchanging. If our purpose is constantly changing, then we begin to realize that whatever gives us purpose today may not give us purpose tomorrow. So our motivation to follow it today becomes rather weak. Why strive today for something that may not even matter tomorrow? It is true that perhaps we fulfilled yesterday's purpose, but that means that every time we find purpose, we know that it is fleeting and will lose meaning soon enough. We will need to search for purpose all over again. And even that new purpose will be rather meaningless. 
Further, the specter of someday being unable to find a new purpose after all, past purposes have, been, have uh, disappeared, constantly hangs over us. We may wake up one day and say, okay, I fulfilled all the other purposes, now I need to find a new one, and I don't know what to do. Thus, we need meaning and purpose that will not leave us, neither tomorrow nor if we live to be 100 or even 200 or 1,000 years old. Meaning and purpose must be unchanging. Third, true meaning and purpose must extend beyond death. If there is nothing but oblivion after we close our eyes in death, then whatever we do here and now ultimately does not matter. Even what we accomplish in this life will eventually end in the cold, uncaring dirt. If we brought happiness to others, they too will eventually cease to exist. So that happiness was a band-aid rather than a cure for meaninglessness. We need something deeper, something even eternal. Meaning and purpose, then, that is based in truth, that is unchanging, and that extends beyond death, truly defeats all that ills man, disease, corruption, and death. Is such meaning possible? Without a doubt, it is. But in contemplating this list years ago, I always felt that something was missing. There is an element of coldness to these three characteristics, something uncaring about them. And then one day it struck me that man is, by nature, relational. Man yearns for love, both to love and to be loved. So I added a fourth characteristic to the list of what makes for true meaning and purpose. For purpose and meaning must be founded in love. If we can find purpose in life that is true, that is unchanging, that conquers and extends beyond death, and that is founded in love, what man would refuse such a powerful force? What man would not give up all perishable and ultimately trivial worldly comforts for this deeper, more meaningful gift? And if such purpose could be found, where is it? And how can we embody it? And finally, could we prove that it exists and that it truly does conquer disease, corruption, and death? So another quote from St. Justin Popovich. In Christianity, truth is not a philosophical concept, nor is it a theory, a teaching, or a system, but rather, truth is the living, theanthropic hypostasis. We'll talk about the word hypostasis in the coming weeks. Theanthropic comes from the combination of the words theos, God, and anthropos, man, God-man. The God-man, and for hypostasis, we could say personage. Truth for Christianity is the living God-man person, the historical Jesus Christ. Before Christ, men could only conjecture about the truth since they did not possess it. With Christ as the incarnate divine logos, the eternally complete divine truth enters into the world. For this reason, the gospel says, truth came by Jesus Christ. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. For Christianity, truth is not a concept. It's not an idea. It's not a system. It is a person. Truth is a person, Jesus Christ. So looking at life's purpose and those four points that I gave, that purpose and meaning need to be true, unchanging, conquer death, and founded in love, we see that Christ and only Christ fulfills all four of these requirements perfectly. Only Christ. And this is the brilliance of the Christian faith. So the following 13 lectures after this essentially just expand upon these simple questions. Why is man broken? What has God done about it? What must we do now? And what results can I expect? Everything that we're going to talk about in the next 13 lectures can be wrapped up in those. And the bottom line is that man seeks to love and to be loved for all eternity. This can only be found in Christ. In our third talk, we're going to talk a lot more about why man suffers so much, what it is inside of us that causes our anxiety, fears, and despair. But ultimately today, we need only to settle on the fact that man yearns deep within him. Whoever you are, whether you realize it or not, we yearn for the eternal. We yearn for Christ, and Christ the God-man yearns for us. But even that yearning, even that yearning is easily misguided, distorted, or ignored. So what does proper yearning for God look like? Again, before we get into all that meat, those proper facts about God and orthodoxy in future lectures, we need to know how to motivate ourselves to not only hear these facts, but to be transformed by them. And for that, we need to look at what motivates us for the faith. For this, we're going to end today with uh, 
I'm guessing it's about six or seven pages from a book. So um, forgive me, I'm going to try not to read too much during these lectures, but I'm going to read for the rest of today. There's a book in the uh, Catechumen book list called The Mountain of si Silence by Kyriakos Marquidis. The Mountain of Silence is a fantastic book with a lot of problems. And if you look in the Catechumen book list, you'll see what the problems are. The author is, is what we call a syncretist. He really likes to the idea that all religions ultimately are the same. And so he talks with this monk who he calls Father Maximus. This is actually Archbishop Athanasius of Cyprus. Cyprus or Crete? Cyprus. Um, but he gives him the pseudonym Father Maximus. Everything Father Maximus says in the book is spot on and like very transformative, very inspiring. It's a great book. But after he says it, uh, Kyriakos Marquidis will then go, I think what he really is trying to say is blah, 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 blah. And you're like, no, you're way off, man. Like, you're way off. <laughs> so it's a great book. Just, just beware of that. However, um, he wrote a few other books. And the book he wrote after The Mountain of Silence, which was very popular, people were very excited about his next book. It's not my favorite, but it has some really good things in it. Um, it's called Gifts of the Desert. And I took... Um, and edit it a little bit just to make it more, more readable for today. Uh, this, this part where he has another conversation with Archbishop Athanasius, again, he calls him Father Maximus, and he talks about the motivations that we have for our faith. And this answers this, this question about what motivates us for a, a good relationship with God better than anything I could ever write, and it's based in the fathers. He doesn't quote those fathers, but he takes this directly from multiple fathers of the church. Um, I read this, and then I read some of those fathers later, and I went, oh, this is where he got this from. So it's directly from the saints of the church. So it begins when Father Maximus says this. He says, You see, Kiriako, Father Maximus replied to my question related to one's spiritual maturity. When you are charged with the spiritual guidance of people, you must figure out what stage they are at. Otherwise, you might give them the wrong advice. Father Maximus explained that by wrong advice, he meant advice that would not help a person advance spiritually. It was like giving the wrong medicine to a patient. What do you mean by stages, Father Maximus? Well, he said, there are three spiritual stages that the elders identify. Each of these stages has distinct characteristics that we must become aware of. How... Marquidus asks, did they come up with the number three? And he answered, it was, of course, the product of their personal experience. Their wisdom, as you know, was not based on just reading books. The holy elders call the first stage the stage of the slaves of God. People at this stage can be deeply religious and devout. They may have a strong relationship with God and a genuine wish to serve him. They may do their best to obey his commandments and harmonize their lives in accordance with what they consider to be the will of God. However, it is fear that motivates them and propels them along the avenue that will lead them towards God. Such people would say to themselves, look, if I don't obey God's commandments, I'll go to hell. I will be sentenced to eternal damnation. Is that a helpful way of looking at God, Marquidus asked? Well, it's helpful if you are at that stage of spiritual maturity. This fear of God functions like a barrier against sinning and as an inducement to obey God's commandments. Furthermore, a person with such an attitude who is at that stage of development can indeed progress towards God. It's a spiritual condition that is real for many people. It's an infantile stage, though. It's the first stage of spiritual growth, which, although imperfect, is real, just like the stage of being a child is very real but imperfect. When a human being is a child, it doesn't mean that he or she is less of a human being, just a human being who is imperfect in terms of maturity. During this condition of spiritual maturity, people see God as a master, an implacable and fearsome despot, who is ever ready to condemn them eternally to hell if they violate his commands. Since some people of particularly careless dispositions, for example, cannot be persuaded otherwise to be decent to others, then a healthy dose of fear of hell and damnation may be the only way to keep them out of trouble from harming others and themselves, both physically and spiritually. God, in his absolute love for humanity, wants everyone to be saved regardless of their level of maturity. In fact, on occasion, we can apply this understanding of God to ourselves regardless of our stage. At some point in our lives, for example, we may be tempted to do something that goes contrary to the will of God. 
we may face a temptation that is so powerful that it can literally suffocate us. At such critical moments, which may appear suddenly in our lives, we may threaten ourselves with a thought that eternal estrangement from God is awaiting us if we succumb. This attitude may serve us like a break that we can step on sharply, bringing our vehicle to an abrupt stop before a precipice. It can be helpful on certain occasions, but discernment is crucial as to when to employ such methods. Everyone with me so far? This is the first stage. Okay? A slave of God is one who obeys God simply because he fears punishment if he doesn't obey him. The holy elders who are great psychologists, call the second stage of spiritual maturity the stage of the employees of God. So we've moved from slaves of God to employees of God. Most of us are at that stage of spiritual development. Such people have gone, at least on the surface, beyond the fear of hell and do what they do because they wish to inherit paradise. They want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In exchange for good works, a person expects to be rewarded by God in this life and in the life to come. People are the employees of God when they want to get paid with the grace on the basis of their good works, or with his grace on the basis of their good works. It's as if someone is saying, look, I work eight hours a day and I expect from you, my employer, 50 pounds in exchange for my labor. I am entitled to this money as a hardworking individual. A person establishes, in other words, an exchange relationship with God. I give to God good works, and I expect grace, good fortune, paradise, whatever. It's important to keep in mind that, while this isn't the healthiest and best way to relate to God, at a certain spiritual stage, such an attitude may be helpful. You tell yourself, why should I fast and deprive myself of food? But then you answer yourself, well, God will reward me as a result of this small sacrifice. He will bless me and my family when I wake up early on Sunday morning and go to church. As a result of my sacrifice, he will prepare a place for me in his kingdom. But isn't this a mercenary understanding of God, asked Marquitas? No. When you're at this stage, you're, so, you're still close to the spiritual child's understanding of God. Or, or to, to a, a, a spiritual a child's, like, a, like an infant's understanding of God. But it's still something. It's a step higher than that of the slave, in the same way that adolescence is a step higher in maturity than childhood. It exercises the soul in its journey towards God. It is definitely better than that terrible rigidity of the heart, that refusal to do anything to help fellow human beings in need, the I don't give, I don't care, I'm not interested type of mentality. This is the attitude of the completely self-absorbed narcissistic personality. In comparison to that, the stage of the employee of God is a spiritual advancement. Such an approach is useful when you are dealing with people who are still not perfectly spiritual or not mature enough and they need some kind of motivation to move forward. You tell a person, come closer to God, and you will see how much more God will offer you. God will sanctify you and your family for the rest of the week, or even a month, or a year. Okay? Do we have that understood so far? The third spiritual condition is that of children of God, also known as the lovers of God. This is the only stage that is real, the only stage that we must project as reflecting the true teachings of the ecclesia, the church, on the nature of God. That is when individuals have come to understand and feel that God is their loving Father, speaking metaphorically, of course. They act and do what they do not because they're afraid that God might send them to hell or because they want to gain a ticket to paradise, but because they love God. I remember a good example that Elder Paisios once gave us. This, by the way, is one of my favorite images. I love this so much. Imagine, he said, if during the second coming of Christ, mistaken calculations were made, and at some point, as more and more people entered paradise, there was no more room for some of those still remaining outside. Then God comes and tells them, Folks, I'm sorry, but unfortunately, paradise has filled up. Find somewhere else to accommodate yourselves. Then, Elder Paisio said, the persons who lack nobility of character will begin to wail and start protesting. Why didn't you tell us before? Isn't there a chance that we can go back so that we can do all the things that we wanted to do? We sacrificed the pleasures of the world for the sake of heaven, and yet we lost paradise as well. On the other hand, the children of God, the lovers of God, will respond, 
it's all right that paradise is full. Don't feel bad, dear God. It is good that paradise is full and you are happy. We'll find a way to take care of ourselves. God wants us to think of him as a parent. This is the healthy way of relating to God. He wants us to relate to him as, a, as children. As we say in church during the liturgy, make us worthy, O Holy One, to dare call you Father, the, the God of heaven. Then we recite the Lord's Prayer, our Father. Christ himself taught us how to pray and how to call God our Father. He did not teach us to call him either Master, Heavenly Ruler, Absolute One, or anything else. Just our Father. This is very important. God has revealed his true nature to us. He said, do you want to know what to call me? What my name is? What I feel for you? I'm your father. Therefore, you are my children. This way of relating to God is by far the most mature and most healthy. Whatever we do, we must do it within the context of this loving relationship. Then we will feel a certain sense of nobility. How should I put it? It is like a child who feels totally comfortable and at home within a loving household. We do not feel like strangers in our father's home, but members of the family. The ecclesia, the world, the entire universe is our home, our, the house of our father. We are neither slaves nor employees in this universe. We are the children of this omnipotent, omniscient, and totally loving God. At the same time, however, we're asked to see our lives with God as a relationship of freedom, said Marquitas. Well, of course, responded Father Maximus. I often feel so disheartened to see spiritual people, priests, monks, and laymen, who turn their relationship with God into some kind of a torture chamber. Elder Paisius used to say to such people, My dear, God is oxygen, and you turned him into carbon monoxide. In other words, they turned their relationship with God into anguish, anxiety, and neurosis. When I meet people in such states, psychologically constrained and miserable looking, I marvel at the distortions they manage to create in their relationship with God. How is it possible, I would ask such religious people, that you as children of God and inheritors of the saints have managed to reach such states of psychological misery? How can you present yourself as an image of God to those who come to you for spiritual advice? The true image of God is that of the loving Father. Now, we as human beings are on an evolutionary path towards God, and we often have the sense of a God who can send us to hell or who can reward us for our good works. But we must always keep in mind that use, useful as these conceptions of God may be on the occasion, they are also imperfect and immature ways of understanding and relating to God. If you wish to know how to relate to God, study the lives of the saints and see how they viewed God. I'm going to repeat that line because this is my advice to all of you. If you wish to know how to relate to God, study the lives of the saints and see how they viewed God. Everything they wrote, everything they said, all the spiritual exercises they engaged in, all the hymns and chants they composed were nothing more than the overflowing of their hearts, which were attached in love to God. There is no greater love than the love of God. Nothing in this world, nothing can transcend or surpass the love of God. When someone truly falls in love with God, then he transcends even his own physical nature. What happens to the person who is passionately in love? That person may not be able to eat or drink or think about anything else except the beloved. Such a person may be absent-minded, may look like a fool, may not be able to rest, to read, or to sleep. The mind is glued on the beloved and wants to be with him or her at all the time. This is the state of the person who has fallen in love with God. Such a person cannot find rest anywhere except in God. This is the state that we're seeking. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to cultivate in our hearts not a new thing. Again, the yearning for God is already there. We're trying to uncover it so that it becomes the way it really is. And then we're trying to find a heart that is so pure that the yearning is responded to with a Lord who calls out to us and says that in return to the words, Lord, I yearn for you. My son, my daughter, I yearn for you too. This is the relationship we want with God and this is Orthodox Christianity. Christ gave us the church to make that relationship possible and a reality. And to make it in such a way that it gives us abundantly more life than we have than just physical existence. This is far more than just a material existence. We live for something so much greater, and we want the eternity of heaven here and now as much as possible.
orthodoxy seeks to make that possible for us. Okay, so we have just under 15 minutes for questions, if there are any questions. Again, I know in future lectures there's going to be more meat, more facts to ask about, but are there any questions today? Three, three stages of spiritual growth. The three stages were the slave of God, the one who fears punishment, the employees of God, the one who expects reward, and the children or lovers of God who, who simply follows the commandments out of pure love for Christ. Yes. It's actually a good question. Can we skip the, the first two stages and go directly to the third? It's, it, I'm glad you asked that because even though these are called stages, we really shouldn't look at them as stepping stones. This is not as if we're going to move from one and then suddenly go to the next and then go to the next and never return to the others. You notice that what he said in there was sometimes that first stage is really useful. You may feel a powerful temptation. As much as you love Christ, you're now realizing you're forgetting Christ. And this temptation is just pulling you and yanking you. You can't think of anything else. And the only thing that's going to get you away from the temptation is stage number one. So these are going to fluctuate one from the other. By the way, he said that he gets these from the fathers of the church. He calls them the elders. I'm talking about the modern elders, but from the fathers. But where did they get it from? They got it directly from Christ. Look in the scriptures. Jesus Christ uses each one of these motivations in the spiritual life. Does he not warn us of hell and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth? He does. Does he not tell us about building mansions in heaven? He does. And does he not call us to love for God and a response to God's love himself? He does. So Christ himself used all three of these because all three of these are necessary. And they're not just necessary for different types of people. Each one is necessary within us. I really want people to be motivated by love of God. I, I want everyone to wake up and say, how can I love God better today? I think that's a good way to manage your day. And at the end of the day, look at your day and say, how did I love God well? And how can I love God better so that tomorrow I can do better? But in the midst of that day, that love of God may have to be tweaked a little bit and turn into a fear of punishment or an expectation of reward, because sometimes those things are really beneficial for us. So you, you, the overall motivation may be love, but in the midst of that, in the midst of temptation, the other two motivations are pretty powerful. You can kind of think of it this way. Even though we, he uses the, the example of growing you know, from a child to an adolescent to an adult, do we always act like adults once we hit that stage? No. And when we are really tempted and we want to sin, what are we doing? We're acting like spiritual infants. We're acting exactly like my three-year-old acts when a toy is taken away from him. But I want it! <laughs> and that's what we do. You know? Don't look at this image. It's going to be sinful. But I want it! It's going to make me feel good. Who cares? Who cares? So what's going to motivate you at that moment? Well, when my kid is throwing a fit, sometimes they use different motivations. If you calm down right now, I'm not going to give you the thing that, that isn't yours, but I may give you this, reward. Or, if you don't calm right, down right now, you may get a little spank. Punishment. <laughs> In the moment of his fit, I'm not going to look at him and say, you should calm down right now out of pure love for me, because <laughs> that's not going to work too well. Now, hopefully I can cultivate that over time and the fit will never happen, but in the midst of the fit, the other two work pretty well. And the more infantile we're acting in our sin, the stronger that first stage is. <laughs> it's just the reality. Any other questions? That was a good one. Okay. Then we completed a miracle today. I finished early. That will not happen again. And so bask in it, and we'll begin Vespers in 10 minutes. God bless you all.